Um, and over the years, I've gone on a lot of solo travel trips. Um, I had the good fortune of my husband working for a major airline starting in 1991. So for 13 years, um, our whole family could fly anywhere in the world for free. And we use those flight benefits a lot. Um, I wasn't really traveling solo at that time because I had four small kids. Um, but over the years, as the kids got older, I took up my solo travel again um, by air. But I, you know, I would always drive different places solo. Um, but it's not really solo travel when you have four little kids tagging along, even though you're in control. Um, and when I started, I guess, um, you know, there are a lot of people who are hearing um, who have no disability, no barrier, and they would never think of traveling alone. Um, but because I had those early adventure experiences, I wanted to travel alone. Um, but there was a time when I had a really drastic hearing depth that I relied on my family way too much. Um, I could no longer talk on the telephone and I felt like my husband was becoming my secretary and I felt like I was losing my independence and I decided almost overnight that um, that is just not an option and so one of the things I did was force myself to travel by myself and it taught me self-reliance to a level that I've never had before. I've always been pretty self-reliant, but when it's just you depending on yourself and no one else, um, you have to become self-reliant. You make all the decisions. Um, so one thing that solo travel reveals is how dependent you are on others in your life to hear for you. And we don't even realize that we're doing that sometimes. And so it's a great way to gauge um, how much of that you have in yourself. Um, let's go to slide five. The other thing that I've learned over the years is how to be a good communicator. Um, I've always been a pretty good communicator, although uh, public speaking is not my, my strength here, but uh, um, when you travel to foreign countries and you travel um, by air, you have to get things right. You can't yeah. stay here. I, and you know, there were times when I first started forcing myself to travel um, a lot of different places where I would go up to the gate counter and I wouldn't really grasp everything that was being said and then I would go sit back down and think, you know, well, that was done. You really should have made sure you got what they were saying. So I had to swallow my pride and go back up and say, you know, I didn't really get that. Could you please write that down for me? And... Um, Going to foreign countries, um, it's almost easier to communicate in a country that doesn't speak your language because uh, people go the extra mile. They use a lot of gesturing um, and, and they do a lot of different things that help you um, grasp what they're trying to communicate and you find ways yourself to communicate. Um, an example of that is I lived in Germany for four years from about 2012 to the end of 2015. And I don't know German. Um, you can make out some of the words, of course, um, in a lot of different languages. Some of the words will be similar to English. Um, so I did a lot of things. Um, if I knew I was going to go on a bus and I would need to ask a question, I would translate the question and write it down so that I could show the bus driver. If I was asking, um, could you tell me when we come to my stop, could you wave at me or, or something like that. Um, 
And, you know, that worked really well. Um, when I first moved to Germany, I went to the store and I forgot the word for eggs. And a lot of other countries, in fact, most other countries um, do not refrigerate their eggs. And so I asked the woman at the natural food store, um, eggs and she had no idea because most people in this manning the small town where we live spoke Bavarian which is very different than German so even if I had known German I wouldn't have known Bavarian and so I took out my pencil and paper and I drew eggs but she wasn't really sure I mean they could have been rocks so then I drew a chicken and she laughed and gave me the thumbs up and she took the eggs out from behind the counter. And, um, you know, there's always different ways that you can communicate and um, traveling um, really helps you do that, especially in countries, foreign countries, uh, in, in countries that do speak English like Ireland and, and the UK. Um, I had a much harder time trying to lip read the English with such a thick accent than I did in foreign countries that didn't speak English. So it was a really interesting um, discovery. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, and I consider traveling by myself um, to be one of the best ways to learn how to self-advocate. You have to get over the um, being diffident and not being direct. Um, you have to tell people what you need. And it really shines a spotlight on how well you're doing that in your life. And, you know, there's a lot of trial and error. Uh, I was in my 40s before I ever um, discovered how to tell people that I couldn't hear. Um, you know, I didn't know what worked. I didn't know what I needed. I didn't know how to tell them to communicate with me. But when you travel by yourself, it's all up to you. You have to advocate. You can't depend on anyone else. And so there are multiple opportunities for you to try out different things. And um, if, if you travel a lot, um, you're going to get really good at communicating what you need um, because of your hearing loss. Um, I usually do not tell people um, I don't label myself. I usually tell them I'm a lip reader and I need to see you speak in order to understand you. And I always insist on people writing um, something down if I'm not hearing it. And so you learn to become a little bit more direct and a little bit more forceful because you need to get it right. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, the other great thing about solo, uh, solo travel is um, it's unpredictable. Travel in itself is unpredictable. Delays, cancellations, misstops. Your plans are not going to um, bear out. <laughs> your plans will always change. Uh, um, and you find solutions. Um, the first time I went to Europe by myself, um, my family was invited to a wedding in Bavaria in 2010. And my oldest son wanted to go a week early. So I decided to go with him, but we wanted to do different things. And so he got our Euro passes and I booked our flights and we flew into Amsterdam. And I was kind of panicky at the thought of traveling by myself in Europe because I hadn't done it before. Um, so I was concerned about, um, uh, I knew that some of the trains in, in Europe split. Um, if you didn't get on the right car, 
that train might stop and split and one half of it would go to one country and another half of it would go to another. So I did my homework, but because I was nervous about that, um, I went to the ticket counter and made sure that I, I knew which car that I needed to get on. And I also had them print out um, all the stops. Um, I, it wasn't necessary to make a reservation on a URL pass. Um, so printing out the stops allowed me to um, be a little bit calmer, but then later on I discovered I could use my Maps app. I had gotten the international package for my cell phone, and I used the Maps app to keep track of where I was uh, on the train. So you, you figure out ways um, to problem solve, and that's a great benefit from traveling by yourself. Okay, and of course, we're gonna to go to the next slide. Uh, the more you travel and the more you have success, um, and then it can be even small things, doesn't have to be something huge. Any success is going to build your confidence. Um, you're just going to not worry about things in the way that you did when it was the first time and every success is going to build your confidence. Okay, if we'll go on to the next slide. Um, there are pretty much five simple rules about traveling by yourself. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be scary if you've not done it yourself, um, but you have to realize that you can't let that um, stop you from doing something you want to do. So define success simply. And that pretty much means if you reach your destination safely, you've done a great job. Things might not have gone the way that you planned. Um, you might not have gotten there in a direct way, but as long as you arrive safely, it's a success. So focus on that. Um, panic is just your enemy. If you let go of that irrational fear of what could go wrong, what might happen, um, if you can do that, the experience is going to go so much better. Um, you need to ask for what you need in confidence. And again, I heard of hearing people tend to be timid and diffident. I mean, I grew up being taught that, not even in relation to my hearing loss, but my mother was very timid, um, very um, diffident. She never wanted to put anyone out. And a lot of times the heart of hearing look at people accommodating them as doing them a favor. And you really have to get out of that mindset. You deserve to be accommodated. Um, it's your right to be accommodated. Uh, you didn't ask for a disability. You didn't ask for hearing loss. And so we need to be a little bit more forceful to ask for what we need. Um, the next thing is to leave as little to chance as possible. Research your destination. Research the mode of travel that you're going to use. And um, just inform yourself, and it really makes for a much better experience. And remain positive no matter what. Um, you can obsess about what didn't go as planned, or you can get angry over a canceled flight or uh, something that goes wrong or something that's uncomfortable, but that's not going to change anything. So I'm um, traveling is gonna teach you some patience and tolerance. Next slide, please. So um, I've had a few people ask me about um, how to start. And I always say start small. You don't have to fly anywhere. You can take a bus in your own town. You can take a trolley, a light rail, a train, um, and just, just plan a small little outing. If you're just really nervous about doing things by yourself, I mean, some people don't even like to go out to eat by themselves. Take a really simple um, first step. 
and do all of those things that I've talked about, um, prepare, um, get the, um, uh, the bus schedule or the train schedule ahead of time and just research um, what you need to know about your day. Um, it doesn't have to be a long trip. And um, you need to practice and, and really, um, you don't have to have any other reason to go other than to practice. If you know that you need to do a dry run through anything, just do it. If it's going to alleviate your nervousness, um, go ahead and do it. But don't do it on a day when you're feeling vulnerable because any kind of misstep or anything that goes wrong is uh, you're not going to handle it well. So try to go when you're in a positive frame of mind. And again, I mentioned this already, be prepared. Get your maps and your timetables beforehand um, and think about what might go wrong and plan for it. If you can, buy an unlimited or flexible pass or ticket. Um, not having a certain time that you have to take a train or a bus um, really alleviates um, some of the stress involved. It gives you some leeway. Uh, you can factor in mistakes there. And that, that was great in Germany. There were a lot of um, things that had day passes. You could get a Bavarian pass for the day and you had 24 hours to use it and you could go anywhere in Bavaria for just a small fee. There was a great pass um, that was the Bohemian Pass and you could almost make it to Prague on that pass and it was the same deal. Um, so sometimes I would just get on the train and go here and there just to practice, um, just to get comfortable with how the trains in Germany worked. And so that's a great thing to do. If you can find flexible passes, it gives you some leeway. Okay, let's go to the last slide, Harry. So once you, you've taken that short trip and gotten your feet wet, just keep pushing towards bigger and longer trips. Try new things. Um, you know, you're probably going to be apprehensive um, until you do it a lot. Um, but don't let that keep you at home. Try new things. And each time you arrive safely, you're going to build that confidence. And before long, you'll be trekking around Europe on a Euro pass and staying in hostels. And remember, it's the things that go wrong that will teach you the most. So don't fear them. Don't be irrationally fearful of them. Um, I'm going to stop short of saying you should welcome them, but um, I often look back and think of the things that have gone wrong and had a, I've had experiences that I never would have planned for um, because of those mistakes. So it's, it's not all bad. Um, I consider training myself to be a better solo traveler, one of the most valuable things that I've ever done for myself. There's no better way to become comfortable and capable with your hearing loss. And there are some things that you can only learn by going solo. Um, the, well, another big benefit is how the world sees people with hearing loss. Um, there's a big misconception out there um, that um, we aren't capable and we're not confident. And the reason I know that is because in my travels, I've had flight attendants, mostly on international flights and just people all over the world um, telling me that I'm impressive. And so uh, I started to ask them why, because I wanted to know why they thought that. And so um, on a flight from Germany, um, I'll tell you what my little spiel is when I board the plane. I, uh, and I tell people this all through the whole process, arriving at the airport, at the ticket counter, at the gate counter, when I board the airplane. 
And I, I tell the flight attendant, I need you to know that I'm deaf, but I don't need anything specific. If you need my attention, just tap me on the arm because I'm a good lip reader. Um, I won't hear the emergency announcements, so you're going to have to come and get me if something goes wrong. And, and people appreciate that. They like being told what to expect from you. They like being told how to communicate. And so that's usually what led to a flight attendant saying, wow, you're pretty impressive. And when I asked them why they thought that, they said, well, most um, travelers that we encounter who are deaf or hard of hearing are never alone. And they tend to be timid and um, don't really say much. And so I, I know that that's the perception that a lot of people have about people with the hearing loss. And it's a wrong um, perception and a wrong assumption. And by being more out there and more confident in doing things on our own, um, we can change that perception. So, um, I'm not, as you can tell, I'm kind of nervous, so I've kind of sped through without telling any stories, um, but I have a lot of experiences that demonstrate some of these things, and if anyone has questions, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. I have a question. Oh, Harry, you sound a little. You have your Harry. You sound a little robotic, so I'll um, handle the question for now. So um, I'm looking at. We have two hands raised right now. So Mo Cheryl, would you like to unmute yourself and go first? Yes. Um... I'm very curious about um, Michelle's travels, but I'm wondering how she deals with the mask problem. She does a lot of lip reading, and uh, I find lip reading is a real problem with masks, as many people have found out. And I'm just wondering how she deals with that, with her hearing loss. Okay, that's a good question, and I'll have to say that coming to Utah is the first travel I've done since March of 2020, so I've not really traveled um, by air or anything. Uh, I mean, I drove to Utah, but I've, I've gone out a lot, um, just, you know, buying groceries and things over the last year and a half, and the masks do pose a uh, big problem, especially for a lip reader. Sometimes I use my Otter or Ava captioning app, um, the speech-to-text app on my phone. But um, the what I do most of the time is just tell people. Um, and um, my way of advocating for myself is just to say what's true. I mean, don't obsess over what you're going to do. Just tell people exactly what's true. Hi, I'm a lip reader. The whole mask thing really wrecks my communication. But don't take your mask off. And, and you know, some people like when people take their mask down, but I don't want them to feel like they have to take it down. So I tell them, don't take your mask off. But if you have a question or we need to communicate, you're going to have to write to me. And they're more than willing to write to you. Um, I went through the drive through after the pandemic first started and I was getting a very simple order. I just wanted a chai latte um, as I went through the drive through and I thought, okay, I'm not going to hear them um, repeat my order back to me. So when I got up to the window, I said, hey, you need to know I'm deaf. I'm not going to understand you because of the mask. So I'm going to give you my order. And then I'm going to repeat my order. And if the second time it's the same and you got my order, just give me a thumbs up. And I mean, it worked fine. So you can always figure out things to do um, when you can't lip read. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Michelle. The next individual I have with their hand raised is Franz Campbell. Would you please unmute yourself? Michelle, I wanted to know if you were wearing a, a heart of earring pin while you were traveling. Um, I actually, I do not have a heart of hearing pen. I know some people like the, the pens that say, I'm a lip reader, please face me when you speak. I rather would um, tell someone, I want to tell someone exactly what I need. And I like to convey a little more information um, than that. And that's just a personal preference. We all have things that we use that we like to use and we're all different and that's great. But I, I want that practice of saying, hey, you need to know um, I'm a lip reader. And I, most of the time, unless I'm traveling, I don't even call myself deaf. I just say, I'm a lip reader. Um, I won't see you. I, I won't hear you unless I see you speak. Um, and then they know not to talk to me when I'm not looking at them or they need to tap me on the arm to get my attention. And I, that's the way I alleviate a lot of issues. I used to um, I really didn't own my hearing loss until I was in my 40s, and I used to just wait for whatever was going to go wrong, and the minute it went wrong, that's when I would tell people, and you're usually panicked um, when you do that, so I inform right up front. I tell people exactly um, what I need from them, and then there's usually no problem after that. Even when I board a plane, I sit down and I say hello to my seatmate and I say, you need to know I'm deaf, so if you need something and I'm not looking at you, just tap me on the arm. Um, I'm a good lip reader and that, that works great. Then there are no problems after that. Thank you, Michelle. The next person that has their hand raised is Connie Lockhart. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, I'm Connie. I'm so glad to be here today with you. And thank you guys for inviting the other groups. I'm from California and I'm the, and it was Harry that sent that beautiful note out. Um, I'm the hearing loss chairman in the city of Orange, California, which is in Southern California. And I am just anticipating going on solo traveling. Um, I'm pretty much an advocate. Um, my big fears, I love the way you said the fear in our heart when we think about going alone. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. My biggest concern is the, an emergency situation. It's hard to grab people when there's an emergency situation and you're always the last person to really know what's going on. And I just had an emergency. Um, I was, it was the end of April, I was in a parking lot and a car pulled out and ran over my foot. And I actually, fast forward, I've had surgery due to the injury and I'm still recovering this poor little ankle. And this older body of mine is, is having a hard time, you know, getting through this, but there was, I had to ask someone to call 911. I had to go to the hospital um, and deal with the paramedics, what drug, you know, and all these. And believe it or not, I have a cochlear implant and a hearing aid. I'm in the hospital after working a full day as a volunteer and my cochlear implant battery is ready to go dead just when all the x-rays, all the CT, all the evidence comes and the doctor is going to talk to me. So now I'm limping with one hearing aid. So just, you know, fast forward to having that happen, happen when I'm out of town. I'm on the East Coast visiting, say, what am I going to do with an emergency? Or have you ever experienced? 
an emergency while traveling. <laughs> Um, I have an ex uh, experienced an emergency while traveling, not by air and not out of the country. Um, but I, and it was while I was driving um, in 2017, I totaled my car in New Haven, Connecticut in a tunnel. I was driving from Salem, Massachusetts, where my son lived, to New York City, where my daughter lived. And um, we were going top speed on the freeway, and there was a five-car pileup in the tunnel. And um, it, it's in slow motion. You see that it's coming. You're going to hit that person in front of you. You know the person in back of you is going to hit you, and time seems to stop. Mm -hmm. And um, first of all, I want to credit my car. It was like a tank. I had a 2016 Honda CRV. And when we hit, I didn't move. And it was just like a tank. So, of course, I replaced my car with the same car. Um, <laughs> after the dust settled from um, the airbags, I got out of the car, made sure I was okay, made sure the person in front of me was okay, made sure the person in back of me was okay. And I saw other people on their phones calling 911. So I know I didn't knew I didn't need to do that. And then I got out my phone and I texted my husband and said, I've been in a um, five car pile up. My car is totaled. Please contact the insurance company. He did that for me. Luckily, he answered my text. Sometimes it takes him forever. And, you know, I handled it. It was one o'clock in the afternoon. And by five o'clock, I had a rental car and was on my way to New York City. And my GPS took me downtown Manhattan on a Friday night. And I wasn't phased. And I credit that to all of my years of solo travel and, and learning that self-reliance, learning to take care of situations that are hard by myself. Um, 20 years before that, I probably would have broke down and cried, just like my mother and my aunt used to do. Of course, I would have had a little more reason to, um, but... Um, when you you travel and things come up like that, and thank goodness I've not had a real emergency um, in my other travels, but I was just so proud of myself for handling that. And uh, and yeah, you have to you have to talk to the police, you have to talk to the record driver, you have to talk to the people at the car rental place, and you insist on what you need. Um, the, the wrecking company kept telling me I needed to call the rental car and I kept saying I can't call the rental car <coughs> because I can't hear you're going to have to call them for me and so he reluctantly called them for me it was something they had to work out and so um, I saw those experiences that you do solo that kind of builds that self-reliance and um, I, I feel like I could handle just about anything that happened. Thank you, Michelle. So next on our list is Melanie O'Rourke. Would you please unmute yourself? Um, hi, Michelle. I'm um, Melanie uh, O'Rourke. I'm uh, with one of the Arizona chapters um, here, and I'm uh, do I have bilateral cochlear implants, and I'm profoundly deaf. I've done quite a bit of traveling, solo traveling, um, but I've also traveled with a hearing service dog. So that's always been um, kind of like my first um, hook that this person has hearing loss. But um, the one thing in traveling that I've been reluctant to try, um, and I wonder if you have a suggestion for, is if you, any of the long flights that you've taken, if you've ever stopped and stayed overnight at you know one of the hotels in the airport to get up to go to another flight and uh, what um, about what concerns me is that I wouldn't hear the alarm clock or I wouldn't even get any sleep so um, 
you know, do you have any suggestions um, for that or how you might handle that? Um, I have had experiences where um, I have had delayed flights. Of course, when you work for an airline, you fly standby. And so that experience of having to fly standby m means that I'm going to get bumped off of a lot of flights and I actually might be spending the night in the airport. Um, I have a little travel um, kit that I take with me everywhere, and uh, it's a Neo um, air mattress, um, a camping mattress. It's only about that thick, and it rolls into um, the size of maybe a water bottle and a compressible pillow and a really lightweight blanket. I always have that in my carry-on luggage, and so I'm prepared to sleep at the airport every time I would miss a flight or I would get bumped and there were no more flights that day. Um, I have left and gone and, and spent the night at a hotel if there's a lot of time um, between, but usually um, it's late at night and I just as soon sleep at the airport. Um, and it is concerning when you're not sure you're going to hear the alarm. I used to use my iPhone as my alarm, and I would put it under my pillow on vibrate, mm -hmm. and that worked pretty well. Um, but right now, I use, um, and I'll, I'll hold it up and show it to you, I have a neosensory wristband. And it, it vibrates to environmental sound. It also has an alarm on it. And one of my concerns when traveling out of the country um, was, or really anywhere, um, am I going to hear that emergency alarm? What if there's a fire in the hotel? And you can get hotel kits mm -hmm. in the U.S., the ADA kits, and I ask for those. But usually I have to educate the hotel personnel on how they work. They don't usually know a lot about them. So I'm, I've always wanted a wearable that's reliable and the neosensory is great because you put it on night mode and it's going to vibrate um, if there's any kind of a, an emergency alarm and of course since I've had it I've not traveled as much because of the pandemic um, but um, I can't wait until you know, countries are open again and I can go overseas and, and try out my wristband to see how, um, you know, much peace of mind it gives me when I'm, I'm somewhere that doesn't have a hotel kit. And a lot of times I stay in hostels, so you don't get um, the same services. And, and one of the reasons I stay in hostels is because I'm going to be in a room with other people. And if something happens, I'm going to know about it because mm -hmm. there are other people in the same room. So when I traveled um, that first time in Europe by myself, I purposely stayed in hostels just because the cheaper you travel, the longer you can travel. So um and I just got used to doing that, and I just absolutely love staying in hostels, even in the U.S. Great. Thank you. I'm writing that neosensory down. <laughs> All righty. Next on our list is Fred Williams. I can send Fred everyone a link to neosensory um, afterwards. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Michelle, I'm, I'm inspired by everything you've told us, and I feel a little better now. And I've decided that if I am traveling, I have an emergency, I'm just going to call you. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, somebody had mentioned the uh, possibility of using Google tr Translate, which is interesting, uh, probably a good idea. I just wondered if you, would in your travels, ever used any transcription services and found them helpful. Um, I have not used any kind of transcription service. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, 
how that would work. And of course, I've not been anywhere internationally um, since 2015. Um, but all of the different apps um, and the captioning in another country were not going to be in English uh, unless English was the language spoken there. So that was always kind of an issue. Um, and you know, I probably wasn't aware of all the translation apps that you could use on phones back then. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of new things that I could use and become aware of. Um, yeah, but, but even, even without those kinds of things, um, in 2017, I went to the Philippines for three weeks. My cousin is married to a Philippine woman, and I consider Amalda my cousin also. But she's from a very small farming village in San Juan, um, Philippines. And while I was there, I learned that I don't have to share a language with anyone in order to communicate. Most everyone did not speak English. Um, the children, Amalda had a lot of nieces and nephews, and the children learned English in school. They would bring me their school books and they would read to me in English, but they didn't comprehend what English meant. And so they really couldn't communicate with you in English. And during that three weeks, we found ways of communicating. Um, and I was just amazed that I didn't really even have to share any kind of a language to be able to communicate. And I think that's because I'm such a flexible communicator. I've always had to use that skill because I started losing my hearing as a child and I didn't benefit from hearing aids and it was just me. And, and in some ways that's a good thing. Of course, I would love to be able to be helped by technology and always wished that I could be but there's something to just being you with nothing. And so I don't have to worry about my batteries dying or that it's just that this is my everyday life. And so I have to figure out ways to communicate and I've become very good at that. And, and I credit solo travel with a lot of that. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Next on our list, we have, and I apologize if I say the name incorrectly, but Kathy Haneke, please unmute yourself. That was very good, yes. Um, <laughs> I have traveled quite a bit. Uh, my observation is uh, nowadays they do have apps for your phones that would really help. Uh, so I do encourage everyone to look into, like if you have a Samsung or whatever model you have, I have an iPhone, Google Translate is wonderful, and it will translate that language into your language, and then you type in what you want in English, and it'll turn it into that language, and you just hold the phone up, and they can read what you're asking in their own language. So do look into that, like, like Michelle has shared so well, you need to be independent. Unfortunately, I have not had as good an experience traveling at airports. I have alerted the staff, yes, I have, I have hearing loss, but they get busy. And so you just have to be prepared. And unfortunately, and sometimes you could get someone there, a recruit with the help of a stranger to help you listen because there's been gate changes and I find myself, what, where did everybody go? You just learn to be observant. If the people that were normally sitting around you waiting for that plane suddenly aren't there, then you know there must have been a gate change. And, but it does make you a little bit apprehensive about going to the restroom and, and leaving the area. So you do have to come up with your own coping strategies. Uh, that is uh, one of the things. Uh, you have to be your own, like she said, self-advocate. Um, but those are the main things. I just do look into the app. You mentioned Ava and um, also Otter. Those are great apps. And you just have to see what your phone is capable of doing. I really admire how well you've done, Michelle, without the adaptive equipment because you traveled before all these things became available. 
And so that's very impressive how you did so well in Germany. I have learned it's been difficult to lip read people from other cultures and, and languages because some do not move their lips much. They speak more from the back of the throat. And that may, or, and I've learned as people without their teeth in, it's very hard to lip read them. So you just work out a little communication system. I'm sorry, I can't, I won't be able to lip read you. So could you point, uh, we just worked out some kind of arrangement. So you gave some great uh, tips, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me give you some of my tips for the airport. Um, again, I mentioned I tell every person along the way um, everything they need to know about me right off the bat. I'm always the first one who speaks because waiting, you're going to run into issues. And I will say I'm deaf. I'm a lip reader. I need to... Um, see what you're saying. I need to see you speak, but lip reading doesn't always work. So if it doesn't, I'm going to have to have you write to me. I stopped asking questions decades ago. You know, you uh, will you please write to me because that gives the person the option to say no. So I tell them um, what they need to do in a nice way. And I've learned to become really direct and um, forward um, to insist on what I need. And I don't do it in a rude way, um, but I let people know exactly what it is uh, they need to do to communicate with me. Um, the gate agents used to always say, yes, I will let you know if there's um, anything that changes. And again, like Kathy said, they forget about you. And I just made myself unforgettable. Um, I would hover there by the counter and sometimes they would even say, go sit down. And I would say, well, no, I'm not going to go sit down because, uh, you know, I've missed flights before where someone was supposed to tell me that the gate changed and they didn't. So I can't rely on you. So I'm relying on myself. I'm going to stand here um, and that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you just do what you have to do to get where you need to go. Um, a lot of people don't know about the special services line. It's open to anyone with a disability. And you can go through security and bypass the long lines by using the special services line. Most major airlines have them. And when I first started using it, a lot of the TSA staff would say, well, this isn't for you. And I'd say, respond that, well, it is, it's for anyone with disabilities. And, um, uh, one of the first flights that I took from Salt Lake City back home, I went through the special services line and the TSA person stopped me and said, you can't use this line. It's only for wheelchair users. And they pointed to the handicap sign. And I said, well, the handicap sign has a person with a wheelchair, but that's not what that means. Could I please speak to your supervisor? The supervisor comes over and says, yes, this woman is correct. Um, this line is for anyone with any disability and um, she can use the line. So by using the line, even though I'm such a seasoned traveler, I don't always need to use it. I get through the regular line pretty well because I know what to expect. Um, I always go through the special services line because it's an opportunity to educate air, airline employees or airport employees. And they're very, um, they're not very knowledgeable about what things mean. They're much better than they used to be, but they still have a long way to go. Um, I always ask to pre-board. And I started doing that years ago when I witnessed a passenger who was blind and they got all kinds of accommodations, which they should have. And I noticed that they were pre-boarding. And so I asked the gate agent, is it possible for me to pre-board? And she just kind of looked at me and said, well, do you really need to? 
And, you know, be, and that's, that's what we get. Our hearing loss is not visible. We look like we're capable and, and, you know, a lot of us are, but that doesn't mean that there's not some stress associated with listening for your boarding call and all of that. So I kind of explained the reasons why someone with hearing loss would prefer to pre-board. And so she let me pre-board. And ever since that time, I've always asked to pre-board. Um, I only do carry on luggage. So by pre-boarding, I don't have to go with the crowd and try to you know, hope that I find a spot on the overhead near my seat. I pre-board and I'm the first one there, so there's always room for my luggage. Um, so there are things that you can do like that and, and ask for the things that are available to you. It's it's not, um, you know, nobody's doing you a favor. They're, they're there for a reason. Um, they, they make allowances for people with disabilities for a reason. So use those services that are available to you. Thank you, Michelle. The next person we have in line is Joe Halfrich. Please unmute yourself. Hi. Joe, did you have a question for Michelle? If you do, you will need to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm going to move on to the I have next no question. Oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. We can't hear you. Questions. This is the captioner. Did you see you have no questions? Okay, um, maybe he did say I no, have so. no questions. Okay, thank you, Joe. The next individual we have in line is Judy Green. Please unmute yourself. Hi, Travel. I'm not deaf, but I'm very hard of hearing. And I traveled extensively in Japan, and I found that the teenage girls loved helping me. I went from Tokyo to the mountains to many small towns. And because they were learning English in school, they wanted to help me and they, and they were willing to touch my shoulder to tell me to get off a bus or a train. So I just thought I would let you know that. And also because I'm not totally deaf, but I am very hard of hearing, I ask people to speak slower and I do that immediately so that I can hear them. And, it, and I wanna ask her another question. I used, I mean a question, I used to hostel a lot. Do you feel, still feel safe hosteling? That's my question. Um, yes, I've always felt safe hosteling. And the last time I stayed in a hostel was a few years ago in San Francisco. Um, when the buzz wristband was coming out, I participated in the testing. And it really was only for Bay Area residents. Um, 
to do the testing, but I had been in communication with a representative from Neosensory and I was really excited about the wristband and I wanted to participate if I could. And so they made an allowance for me and I flew to San Francisco to pick up my wristband and stayed for a week. And I stayed in a an independent hostel and sat right in the middle of the city in San Francisco. It was kind of known as a party hostel. Um, it was mostly young people. And for some reason, I must have checked that I didn't mind if I were in a mixed room. And so the entire week, I shared a room with four young guys from various <laughs> countries and they kept switching out. And, um, you know, I, I didn't ask to be changed and they were all really nice. I would let them all know that I, I couldn't hear. And so because it was a party hostel, they would be out all night partying while I was sleeping. They'd be coming in early in the morning when I was be getting up at five. And so it worked out perfectly and I felt very safe. Um, usually in a hostel, you have a way to secure your personal belongings um, that you only have the key to. Um, and I liked the independent hostel. I had not stayed in an independent hostel before, but they provide you with fresh food and you can actually cook your own breakfast <laughs> if you don't want to go to the breakfast display that they have. Um, I also wanted to mention that coming back from my trip in the Philippines, I flew through Japan. I didn't leave the airport. But one thing about Japan is the signage is really good because most people do not speak Japanese and Japan has a lot of um, tourists and visitors. And so the signage in the airport was excellent. And I think um, the reason was that um, there aren't a lot of people that speak Japanese. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I don't see any other hands raised in the chat. However, I have a question for you. So when I was traveling domestically, I had to change planes before I got to my final destination. So when I boarded my first flight, I approached the stewardess before actually getting on the plane. And I mentioned to her that I have a hearing loss and that I will not be able to hear announcements regarding connecting flights when we get closer to the layover. And she paused a second, said, wait just one minute. She turned around and then she handed me a flight brochure in Braille. So I would like to know from you, how would you handle instances of ignorance where people just don't get that you have a hearing loss or think you need some accommodations that are certainly not related to hearing loss. Um, yes, that has happened to me more than once, um, usually on an international flight. Um, and because my husband worked for the airlines, I usually picked flights that had a lot of room on them. If I were, was flying internationally, that meant that I got business class. So I had a seat where I could lay down and you got your meals you know, hot meals provided. Um, and usually it was someone bringing me the Braille menu after I informed them that I um, was a lip reader and, and that. And you don't want to make them feel humiliated or anything, but you can actually use some humor and say, I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. <laughs> Um, or something like that. And then the other flight attendants would be around and, the, and they would look at the other flight attendant and the, she would realize, okay, Braille is for people who are blind, not for people who are deaf. And I'd say, you know, I thank you for trying to accommodate me and I appreciate it, but um, I don't need Braille. I can see just fine, thank you. Um, so I, I never try to be rude because we all make those kind of 
have those duh moments. I have them myself a lot. I never want to make somebody feel bad, but that has happened to me more than once. Thank you, Michelle. Does anyone else have any questions for Michelle? If you do, you can unmute yourself right now. I don't see any more hands raised in the uh, participant list. So I'll give it a few, a minute or so to see if anybody else wants to chime in. You know, I do want to make one comment about safety. Um, somebody had mentioned about wearing a sign that says you're hard of hearing. And I know I've heard people talk about having like a sticker on their window of the car. Um, I don't think we really want to advertise that we are hard of hearing and, you know, because people can take advantage of that too. And we want to be careful. So like Michelle says, anyone that needs to know that we're dealing with, they can hear, but the general people, you know, we don't want to advertise. Is that what, how you feel, Michelle? Um, I've never really felt like I've been targeted for a crime because I have a hearing disability or I'm not going to hear anyone. Um, yeah, I, you know, I know some states have, uh, I, I think people, some people have told me that you can identify as being deaf or hard of hearing on your license plate or, or, you know, and I know they have the stickers on the windows for um, the fire department to let them know that someone um, in the home is deaf. Uh, again, that kind of makes you think twice. Um, but I, I don't know if wearing a button is going to um, make you more susceptible to something like that. Um, again, my reason for not wearing the button is I want to tell people exactly what I need from them. And there's not really a button that says that. And, and we all need different things. What I might need might not be what you need. And so I like having to tell people what I need because that makes me better at it. Um, so that's my, my reasoning for that. But yeah, a lot of people like the buttons. Absolutely. I agree. I'd like to... Uh to follow up on that because our hearing loss association chapter, and by the way, I'm from Florida and uh, not that that makes any difference, but uh, we've been talking about advocating for ourselves because nobody else is going to do it unless you do it. So when I was referring to a sign, I was talking about going into the airport and I'd been through this uh, and going through um, security, and I have implants in my body that I cannot go through the scanner. And I've had major problems with people who do not understand what I'm trying to tell them. So I made a sign, and this is my sign. <laughs> And I just feel that um, I'm going to try it this time. I'm flying in August, and I'm hoping that this will make a big difference. Uh, so it's, it's important that we advocate for ourselves. It's important that we take care of ourselves. Nobody else is going to do it for us. So I think this is important. Thank you. Um, you know, I think that's great. Do whatever you have to do to get across what you need people to know. Um, I've never ever thought about, you know, wearing a sign like that. But yeah, especially if you have cochlear implants where you can't go through um, the x-ray or, or, you know, the scanning or whatever. Another instance would be if you're stopped by the police, I know they have the, the play cards that you display in your window. I've never had an issue um, really with being stopped. I've only been stopped for speeding. I like to speed. <coughs> Um, 
But I usually, as the officer comes up, I say, you need to know I'm a lip reader and I need to see you speak. And if I don't understand you, you're going to have to write to me. Um, but yeah, I, I can see instances where a sign would be great. And I say, hey, I'd, I'd wear a neon sign on my forehead if that helped. If I may make a suggestion about the signage, um, here in St. Louis, which is where my chapter is, uh, there was some advocacy where uh, the police department came up with a signage system, like all you have with the decal on your back window, and it would say A, B, or C, and they knew in their department whether A was for blindness, C was for deafness, in other words, they gave it a, de uh, a designation, so this way, if they pulled you over, they knew right off the bat that you had hearing loss, or you were deaf, or you were blind, whatever the case might be. Frankly, I don't think there'll be too many blind people driving, but anyhow, they would just know that you have some kind of disability, but it would not be known to anybody else but A, B, C meant. But this would be a decal in the window of your car. And so each chapter really has to advocate for themselves. For example, some chapters have um, hospital kits and that may work for them. And uh, uh, like Florida chapter mentioned, you know, uh, there are other kinds of kits out there and we have to be advocates as a chapter also. So this is just a suggestion that everybody put your thinking caps on and see what your needs are and, and work for that. Because uh, there is, we have, it's our job to get the information out there. And I know in our chapter, I gave a talk about traveling. And one thing I have learned is that you could, when you sign, uh, when you uh, buy your flight tickets, Right then and there is when you let them know you have hearing loss. Because we found out that the airports really do want to know. I mean, the airlines. Because they want to put you where they know where you are because they're responsible for you. And so they really do want to take care of you. But you have to be, you have to advocate, like Michelle said so well. So anyhow, those are just suggestions. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to first thank Michelle for her presentation today. Michelle, we learned an awful lot from you today. Um, and I speak for everyone here that it was a wonderful presentation and there was a lot to take away from it. So thank you. I also want to thank everybody else for including your suggestions um, when you were speaking, as well as all the great suggestions in the chat as well. So thank you for that. So before we wrap up, I want to take, uh, take the opportunity to let you know about some, coming, some upcoming events for the remainder of the year for our chapter. So every month we host a virtual happy hour chat and the next one will be on Friday, July 16th from 7 to 8.30 Arizona time. Anyone is welcome to join if you would like. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite beverage of choice and join us for a great chat with lots of laughter and com camaraderie. So Connie is going to put the registration link in the chat if you are interested. So that will be a week from yesterday. For our August social event, we will be hosting a virtual interactive baking class. So details are gonna be shared soon via our listserv and through our social media. And when I say interactive, what that basically means is that everyone who registers for this event will receive a recipe with ingredients. And uh, we have a professional baker that will be guiding us in the steps to bake this wonderful dessert. And we will all be doing it together. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm really excited about that. Our next chapter meeting is scheduled for September 11th, 
and we will have a panel of working adults with hearing loss that are going to share their challenges and successes in the workplace. Details will, again, be forthcoming through our listserv as well as our social media. The Walk for Hearing in Arizona is going to be in person this year. Yay! It will be at the Riverview Park on Saturday, November 6th. Registration will begin at 8 o'clock in the morning, and the walk will kick off at 10 a.m. Note that there will not be a kickoff luncheon this year. Unfortunately, um, it was decided that we wouldn't do that, and we're just getting back to in person. If you would like, however, to join our Arizona Working Heroes team for this event, follow the link that Connie will put in the chat and stay tuned for updates in the upcoming months. Um, I just wanted so the to last thing. Oh, I'm go sorry. ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to say thank you for having me and it was a pleasure to be here and I thank all of you for your questions and um, um, just thank you. We were happy to have you, Michelle. So one last thing I wanted to mention is Christmas is still six months away. However, it will be here before you know it. We want to invite all of you that are local to the Phoenix area to the annual short Christmas party this year that will also be in person. The theme this year is a coastal Christmas. So dress accordingly in your best beach wear, but be conservative. No swimsuits, songs, or bikinis, please. Details will be shared as we get closer to that event as well. So are there any other last minute questions, comments before we wrap up? Okay, if not, thank you all for coming. And again, thank you, Michelle, for joining us today and sharing your experiences and if you are interested in joining any of our future events, or if you have any questions about the Arizona Working Adult Chapter, feel free to send an email to azworkingadults at gmail.com. And Connie, if you could put that email in the chat too, that would be helpful. Meanwhile, if you are not in the Phoenix area and not experiencing heat waves, enjoy the weather outside. For the rest of us, we are going to try our best to stay cool in this heat wave. All righty. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.